This week has been an absolute blast when it comes to information about Europa Universalis 5 or as some people would like to call it Project Caesar because we all know Project Caesar is EU5 and today's Tinto Talks has been insanely informational. Not only that but this past week Johan has released a few other articles on Tinto Talks forum where he showed some options from the settings screen of EU5 as well as one of the most properly requested features likely in in the EU4 community, the ability to have the Byzantine Empire named as the Eastern Roman Empire because as we all know historically, they didn't call themselves the Byzantines, they called themselves the Romans. They considered themselves and they were the Roman Empire which officially ended in 1453 with the fall of Constantinople for the last time to the hands of the Ottoman Empire. Now with this of course we have the spot over here where we realize that the setting screen for EU5 is pretty much identical to the CK3 setting. If we take a good look at the CK3 game itself, simply checking the game rules in uh, Crusader Kings 3, you clearly see it's the same. It's actually the exact same. Take a good look at this. Even the text below it, look at that. For the matrilineal marriages, you see uh, certain words highlighted in uh, blue, whilst other words are just underlined, which means you can hover over them and you can see what exactly that word actually means means in the context of the game and then you go back to here and you see that Greek Byzantium and Rome also highlighted which shows that you will be able to see some more information about the culture the city or the country as well as other terms probably will have a little bit more explanation when you hover over them with country as well being uh, highlighted as blue just like in the CK3 settings so that tells me that the engine for EU5 is basically a carbon copy copy of CK3's engine. However, it's been four years of development for EU5, so we can definitely expect a lot of changes to that engine. Just because they're using the same engine does not mean that it is the same. It's probably a very much so improved version of the uh, CK3 engine, since obviously CK3 is already out, which means that they cannot really make that many improvements on a game that's already out. Whilst the game that has not yet been released, the basic core engine can be changed n amount of times as required in order to make it more optimized, give you better performance, give more options and so on, right? Plus, Johan said in one of the previous posts himself that all of this is still placeholders, so it's very likely that the settings or the options as we see over here are going to be different whenever the game actually is released and this is just right now the one from CK3 because it was easier for them to just use this for the time being. Now as you guys know, I don't want this to just be me reading out the new dev diary for Tinto Talks, which we will do. Of course, I also want to show you guys everything that we have information from Johan himself about the combat system, about navies, about armies, what we can actually assume from the words that have come out of uh, this man's fingers, I guess, right? They're not actually words coming out of his mouth. They're just words typed in, I guess. And I'm doing this now because I do think that we have enough information compared to what we had previously. I've gathered all the information from the six dev diaries so far and all the common threads. And I'm also really happy to see that Johan listens to the feedback that we give on the forum. In fact, he starts the new dev diary by saying, welcome to the sixth Tinto talk, where we talk about the design and features of our not yet announced game with the code name Project Caesar. But then he says, before we jump into the day's topic, I would like to show something very fresh out of the oven. Based on feedback from last week, this is why we are doing these Tinto talks to make Project Caesar your game as much as ours. And this is the result of the feedback. We have uh, the layout for the estates a little bit changed a few things have been added in here and we can see now the crowns alongside the amirs ulema commoners dimmies and burgers so far none of the privileges have been given out so i cannot get any sneak peek in any of the new privileges but we do have uh, an idea of the new layout so i have to reiterate that paradox does listen to your feedback guys so make sure you go over to the forums if you have any questions about e5 if you really want them to add something in specific or comment on this video as well i'm sure that your comments are going to get uh, read either by the Paradox team if they do listen, if they go to the comment section, or if not, I will probably read them in my very, very soon to come video addressed to Paradox themselves. Probably going to be out in a couple of days, actually. So this is basically your last chance of getting your comments read, at least for that video, right? So let's start delving into the concepts of EU5. So these are going to be completely nude, not something that was uh, present in EU4, but something that definitely is present in CK3 in a different 
different way though it's not the same so we have the concept of control here but it's not the same control as we have in ck3 we're we're gonna explain it in detail here johan says not every location on the map is the same especially not in a game with such a scope as project caesar by default every ownable land location is a rural settlement but there are two upgrades to it that can be done first you can found a town in a location which allows you to increase the population capacity of the location and allows for a completely different set of buildings than a rural settlement finally you can grant city rights to a town which allows for even further advantages now you may wonder why don't i make every location into cities besides the cost and the population requirement there's also the drawback that each of them tend to reduce your food production while also adding more nobles clergy and lots of clergymen to the country so what does that mean we're essentially getting the same building system and same village slash town slash city system that we have in imperato rome so for example we have this entire state here right this is the uh my bad this is the province of latium so it's exactly the same like in project season it is a province and within that province we have locations just like we have in project caesar and these locations can be either a village like uh, fregele here is a village it's called a settlement not a village in imperato rome so just the name is different and it has its own unique buildings as consequence then we have towns or as they're called in uh, imperator cities and they have different buildings as consequence and the amount of buildings that you can build is not limited like it is in eu4 and then you have metropolis which uh, in eu5 terms would be the city so i'm showing you guys this and i also showed the ck3 bit before because i'm pretty sure that this is the most ambitious project that paradox has ever created for a reason i think that they intend this to be the flagship of paradox just like e4 was the flagship for a very long time until it got dethroned by hearts of iron 4 and i do have some worrying things about it but at the same time which i'm gonna address later in the video uh but at the same time i'm happy to see that they're putting so much work into this game because it means that our say what we ask about the game is gonna get its due diligence and johan for sure will listen to whatever feedback we give him on the forums and just like in imperator rome you might want to keep around enough villages because if you only have towns and cities in your province then you're not getting any food and without food your people are going to starve and die so famine as we learned in one of the previous dev diaries is a thing in eu5 so make sure you have enough food to feed your population feed your armies the amount of depth to this game is just insane really like it's actually insane you have stuff like the plague which can decimate your economy and your manpower pool you have famines you have you know i just realized i'm, I'm saying these really horrible things with a very joyful voice as if it's something amazing obviously these are horrible things to happen but it's it's cool that we can do this as gamers in a video game right that's what i'm trying to point out here i'm not a psycho i promise and i like to see the added bit here that nobles clergies and burgers get more influence if there's more cities towns rather than village we have the very first map of the northern parts of uh europe namely sweden you can tell from this map that denmark owns the northern parts of uh the baltics the livonian order owns a big chunk of that as well whilst we also have riga better depicted we have dorpat kurland also now i'm gonna be using the very much so popular mod voltaire's nightmare 2 to illustrate something important some people might be saying and i'm 100 percent sure that we're gonna see some uh, threads on the forum already about why in this mod estonia owns the northern bits that clearly in the dev diary is owned by denmark everything else is pretty much on par and it makes sense but denmark in the dev diary map owns estonia rather than um estonia being its own independent thing here's why truth is that between 1332 and 1340 denmark was in a pretty bad spot they didn't actually have a leader of sorts now in voltaire's nightmare it says that they are a junior partner themselves of rendsburg now, rendsburg is over here by the border between the danish lands and the hre proper let's say so the backstory of this a little bit is that between 1332 and 1340 denmark didn't actually exist it is basically one of the biggest disasters in danish history and it's a result of christopher ii having been basically cucked in a way by 
the magnates and this guy count gerhard of rendsburg count gerhard and the magnates basically destroyed denmark and it wasn't until 1340 when technically denmark was again a country with its own king valdemar the fourth the son of christoph who managed to put back the pieces of the danish kingdom and return it to its former glory so although nominally estonia in 1337 would still be danish crownless it wasn't actually ruled by Denmark since Denmark didn't really exist as a country it was literally pawned off to the German nobles and uh, and to the magnates who established their own little republic I'm not sure how exactly Johan wants to depict this but remember that earlier in the dev diaries he did say that he wants to make a separation between country as in physical provinces and country in name I think this is what he meant by that right I think that Denmark is going going to be one of those countries that will still exist on paper maybe whilst the lands themselves will be not ruled by the actual king of Denmark I don't know how exactly he's going to implement that but it's really juicy and I'm super hyped to see how exactly he's going to make that work maybe we're going to see some new type of disaster mechanic because of that who knows right I feel like they made an amazing choice with making 1337 the start date for EU5 since there's so many things going on in Europe way more than 1356 right which is basically just the golden bull now they they also mentioned that Stockholm, Dublin, Belgrade are examples of towns at the start of the game, while cities include places like Beijing, Alexandria, and Paris. So the bigger places with the higher pops are going to be cities from the start, essentially. Also, a little bit surprised that Riga here is not... I mean, I don't get this. Riga and Riga again. Is it because technically one was the archbishop and the other one was the city? Or how? Why is it separate Rigas? Now, I'm going to have to stop uh, admiring this map. I love it, but... But we got some really important stuff we need to talk about. Control. Now you might know a little bit about control from CK3, but don't let the name fool you. It's not the same as it is in CK3. In fact, it's completely different. So every location that you hone has a control value. What is control? It's an EU4 feature, actually. It's autonomy from EU4. But the way that autonomy, I'm sorry, control works in EU5 is very different. It is primarily determined by the proximity it has to the capital or another source of authority in your country there are only a few things that can increase it above its proximity impact but many things that can decrease it further this is probably the most important value you have just like autonomy new for as it determines how much value you can get out of it as it directly impacts how much you can tax the population in the location the amount of levies they also contribute when they are cold a lack of control reduces the crown power you gain from its population whilst also reducing the potential manpower and sailors you get and weakens the market attraction of your own market making them likelier to belong to foreign markets if they have low control it means this is autonomy with added effects the way it's going to work is you have control centers your capital is going to be a control center i'm going to call it a control center it's probably not going to be called control center that's the term i'm giving it and then it says there's going to be other sources of authority in your cap in your country that means there's going to be other spots you can build let's call them control outposts from which you can get more control to the surrounding areas i'm assuming that cities are going to be a source of control or if not cities then some sort of building that you build within those cities are going to be some sort of control so having a pretty sizable nation also is going to require that you have enough control over your provinces with minimal control it says here that provinces that have less control are likelier to belong to foreign markets Markets. So we just have a confirmation that we're going to get a market system like we have in Viki 3. And your own provinces will join those markets if the control is not big enough. That's kind of similar to EU3 if you ask me. Where, you know, shenanigans like that could have happened. This map shows the control value with the red bits uh, essentially being provinces that have very little to no control. And this is what it looks like, the effects of control. The control of Kalmar is 56%. It changes by 0.20 each month with a maximum of 58.20%. And these are the effects. Crown power reduction, sailors and manpower reduction, the amount of levies 
and market protection you get. Market protection is basically half of the control with levy sizes, uh, the amount of control. This also gives access to 56% of potential tax base of Kalmar. That's not the amount that you're going to get. It's potential tax base. I'm guessing there's going to be some system of tax efficiency, which scales with the amount of potential. And I know I said potential really weird. It's just how I am. Okay, don't judge me. This means you want to have your control value as close to 100 as possible. So it's the opposite of autonomy, right? Zero autonomy means you get all the tax, all the manpower. Zero control means you get none. 100 control means you get all the taxes and all the manpower and so on, right? So now that we discussed what control is, let's talk about two more features that are going to be added to EU5, proximity and maritime presence. What is proximity? It's basically a distance to capital value where traveling on the open sea is extremely costly. Proximity is costly over land, but alongside coastlines where you have high maritime presence, you can keep a high proximity much further. Tracing proximity along a major river reduces the proximity cost a fair bit. And if you build a road network, that will further reduce the proximity cost. There are buildings that you can build like the bailiff that will act as a proximity source, but that has the slight drawback of adding more nobles to that location and will cost food for them. So what did we get from this? We get that we have confirmed two buildings, bailiff, and I'm assuming it's going to be the same type of building as we had in EO3. And we also have roads like we have in Imperator Rome. Now, call me dumb dumb, but having roads means that we're likely going to have control also influenced by roads. So say if you build roads in either direction from your capital or from a source of control, it could give increase in control in the provinces that have roads, right? Since it's easier for your source of control to exert its control over those areas by sending units, right, on those roads to control it better. That's that's my own assumption that road systems are going to be like that. Also, probably road systems are going to increase the speed of your armies moving on them. Dude, can you imagine? This game is going to be like five different games into one. Like, they're taking all the great features from all the games they've got and they're putting it into, into Project Caesar, the ultimate EU5. And some of you might be saying, oh, Ludi, this means it's Imperator Rome 2. This means it's CK4. No. Why? Logically, Imperator Rome is a failure of a game, unfortunately. From a marketing perspective, I'm not saying it's a bad game. I love Imperator Rome and I highly encourage you guys to play it. But from a marketing perspective, it makes no sense for this to be Imperator Rome 2 when nobody is expecting that or wants that. It's also obviously not Vicky 4 since Vicky 3 just came out. It's not CK4 since CK3 just came out and there's plans for a lot of other expansions for CK3. And why would they do the same game with the same engine? It's obviously EU5. If you have a little bit of a thought about it and you don't have a smooth brain, you realize this is EU5. Now let's talk about maritime presence in every coastal location around your locations or where you have special buildings, you will have maritime presence. This is slowly built up over time based on your ports and other buildings you have in adjacent locations. Placing a navy in the location helps improve it quicker, but blockades and pirates will decrease it quickly, making it absolutely vital to protect your coastlines in a war or you're going to suffer the consequences for a long time. As mentioned earlier, the maritime presence impacts the proximity calculations, but it also impacts the power of your merchants in the market the sea zone is a part of. We also have here a little bit of a image, the Riga market, and then we have what I'm assuming is the trade power in the Riga market. We got the Hanseatic League, and I'm assuming this is their maritime presence over here. It's going up by 2.24. Next week, we'll do an overview of the economic system, which has quite a lot of new features, as well as some features from older games, not game, but games. That's important to keep in mind. Now, remember guys that he said that, Johan said that uh, the economic system is going to be shown at a later phase, right around the time closer to when we are more ready to announce the, the game itself. Economic system is next week, guys. What does that tell you? Are we going to get a confirmation this is EU5 this year? Maybe this next couple of months? Who's to say, right? Let's also go through the comments before I talk about the uh, army and the navy, what we know about it so far. He mentions that the uh, icons are generic placeholders for now. There is a minimum value for control. Once it reaches zero, you get basically nothing from it, more or less. In the early game, proximity range is a lot smaller. They will likely add the Eriksgata as a road for 
for the Swedes at the start. And by saying this, he actually confirms, I just realized, that Rhodes will increase control. Because the guy asks, did West Sweden really have such low control? And he says, in theory, we should add the Eriks Gata as a road. That, in essence, means that Rhodes are going to increase your control. <laughs> Johan unwittingly confirmed that Rhodes increased control. Hell yeah, I love reading this man's replies to the comments because he always gives away so much. I love him. Can control sort of behave like uh, EU4 autonomy where you can consciously reduce your control in a location in exchange for less unrest? No, there are different mechanics for that. So there's not going to be an option of just flat out increasing your control in an area by just pressing a button. That's not going to be a thing. And that's a recurrent theme for EU5. Nothing's going to be basically just click a button and that increases by a certain amount. It's just going to be things that slowly scale with time. I think they're doing this so that they can make sure that people play the game for more than just a hundred years so that you know the more you play it the more fun it gets in the later part of the campaigns how can proximity be made faster can roads and canals be built hex roads can be built there are texts that improve most of it as well okay interesting can cities be reduced to towns or be completely wiped out can cities be depopulated as in population move to more suitable or attractive location Mets over here is literally asking can we commit cultural conversion isn't he in a nicer term and Johan says they can be depopulated so there's going to be a way of doing a cultural conversion i guess what happens if a territory is an exclave will it have any control at all without a bailiff or just a big penalty with no bailiff or similar you will not have control whoa that is a big deal and also he just confirmed that bailiffs are going to increase control so it's not control outpost it's literally just bailiffs <laughs> very surprised sailors weren't removed they work differently than in eu4 so that's okay good to know high control is always good obviously there's more estates on the table yes so aside from the ones that we've already seen there's likely going to be more estates like the unique rush puts and so on that we have in eu4 already does the wealth that's not taxed because of the lack of control go to the estates yes so less control over your provinces means your estates get richer interesting remember that estates will have their own investment pool sort to say right like in vicky 3 which they can use to build stuff should they wish to right now that we finally see some of the north will norse mythology exist yes there will still be some tiny remnants left so we have norse confirmed will colonial nations be present in the game i imagine it will be very difficult to maintain control of locations on a different continent yes they are something you actively want to set up even if you are not forced to so that means it's not like an eu4 where colonial nations are going to be automatically set up but it will be something that you can actively do and likely going to be encouraged to do i want to see the hre mac from from this projection <laughs> uh, is this where i say that i really enjoy no shot no act oh my god dude no shot did he just say i really enjoy voltaire's nightmare me too i freaking love voltaire's nightmare bro does this mean project caesar is gonna have this hre i mean all of these little hre oh my god that is gonna be actually mind-blowing if if project caesar has this hre i swear to god I'm gonna fly over to Tinto and I'm gonna buy Johan and the production team a beer, get them drunk, bring him to a secret location, and then I'm gonna put them all in charge of one of these little nations. I'll put Johan as the emperor, and then we're gonna have a massive dev clash for the launch of EU5 where everybody's just playing in the HRE. That's, I I'm telling you, I'm gonna do that. Give me at least 200 HRE nations. <laughs> Okay, okay, enough excitement. Let's get back here. Let's get back here. Is the Hanseatic League a dynamic name for Lubeck or is it one of those countries not based on owning land, i.e. trading a league acting as one country for the purpose of trade? It's not a dynamic trade for Lubeck. That's all I will say now. Okay, not dynamic trade for Lubeck. So that means that what we see here above as the Hanseatic League means a type of an alliance. So it kind of plays into what he said earlier in one of the earlier dev diaries that we talked about about where there's different tiers of a nation existing so okay oh man I, I, can i just play the game already please <laughs> can we just have this release tomorrow are rivers going to be navigable no they are not it's a bit hard to have a naval battle involving only a few dozen ships of the line on them <gasps> we're going to get ships of the line we're actually going to get proper ships in eu5 not the shitty ck3 system that we have huh confirm from the words coming out of the hand of the man here very important thing it takes several years to 
to upgrade a town to a city and that only so it can allow all other things. Manpower is 100% connected to pops. So that means if you lose population, if you lose units in battle, you actually lose the population in your city. That is confirmed. Project Caesar has no autonomy system because they have a control system, which is similar. UI is placeholder except for illustrations. Unrest and control are not directly related and control can make it easier to reduce unrest. So unrest is a separate value. Good to know. Do you still have forts? Yes. Low control in itself is not the reason for rebellion. So I'm guessing unrest is going to be the reason for rebellion and liberty desire maybe in pops. So is settlement town city something we control directly? Yes. 99.99% likelihood of Cossacks coming back in. We do have a sprint for adding content to that region this spring. Okay. So as we speak, they're adding content to the Eastern European bits. Love to hear that. You know, as a Eastern European myself. He also addresses Riga being twice here. It says it's a bug. It's actually two separate nations. So it is the Archbishopry of Riga and the city of Riga as I expected it to be. I like how he also explains that navies are going to have a much bigger impact in the game itself. So that navies will help with the making maritime presence tick up faster, making sure pirates are dealt with so you don't lower your presence and making sure you actually have a maritime presence during and after a war. As I said earlier, he did say here that there are no building slots and that population gets promoted over time so peasants can become nobles and so on. Are there checked lines on the map roads? Yes. So we're going to visually see the roads on the map. I'm assuming what that means. Now, I also want to use one of the most prestigious programs imaginable in order to illustrate what armies are going to be like in EU5 or in Project Caesar, at least from what I garner from uh, the uh, dev diaries and from the comments from Johan. Don't despair. This is not the same program they're going to use in EU5 Trust. I'm talking about Microsoft Paint. It's easier for me to explain with Microsoft Paint. Just, uh, just go with it, okay? So there's two values that we saw in today's dev diary, for example, that are really important. We saw levies and we saw manpower as two separate things. Why is that? Well, my assumption is that since we already know that levies and professional armies are going to be separate things in uh, Project Caesar, we're going to add professional armies, pro armies as a third category here. Now, my assumption is that levies is what most nations will start with and it's going to be based on technology or legislation. So laws or techs will dictate what kind of uh, armies you have, be it pro armies or levies, and that manpower is going to be used both for pro armies and for levies. The difference being that levies are not standing armies, whilst pro armies are standing armies. That means that the manpower required for pro armies will be always occupied by units recruited as standing armies, whilst the manpower used for levies is going to be just temporary. When you disband the levy, the manpower is going to go back into the manpower pool, or maybe the manpower is just going to be for pro armies, not for levies, but that wouldn't make too much sense if you ask me. It might make more sense from a coding perspective. It might make it easier from a coding perspective to have levies as a separate thing and manpower a separate thing where they only use manpower for pro armies, but it wouldn't be very immersive. So that's why I'm going with this system as it stands right now. Texts and laws are likely going to be required to have pro armies. And let's face it, in 1337, there were certain nations around the world that did have pro armies or standing armies, whilst majority of nations actually had levies with the guards of the king. So even in my lands in Valachia and Moldova, there used to be the standing little army. It was actually called the little army and the, the levies were called the grand army, where they would summon the grand army in case of war. And the little army was always a standing army that protected the king or the voyevod in our case. And it was a professional one that was getting the training and the uh, armors and everything that they were required. Now, considering that EU5 is going to last until 1783 or something, I, I remember Johan mentioned the end date in one of the comments as well. It might be 1780 something. I remember when, but he did say 1780 something. I remember. So considering it's up until then, levies likely will stop existing after the first couple hundred years, as most nations will just phase these out when they get the right technology and laws, or maybe not. Maybe you're going to get levies until the end of the campaign. Who's to say? After all, levies were technically used even in the 17, 1800s by certain areas of the world, right? The big problem with levies is that it's likely going to be easier to wipe out levies as they're not going to be professional units. And remember, whenever a unit dies in combat, that's one population that you lose. So if you lose 200,000 soldiers in 
a war, that's 200,000 pops that you lost. So of course, going for pro armies is going to be the play. The sooner, the better. Now, everything I'm talking about here when it comes to the army system is just what I got from the dev diary. So if it's completely different, then it's not my fault. This is just my interpretation. Take it as, a, as you will. But I like this system if it's going to be like this. This is going to be a really great system in my opinion. It's basically similar to how it is in ck3 really with the difference being that the pro armies are not just going to be the armies of the kings you know the little brigades that you have it's going to be the entire nation can be turned into professional armies so it's going to be on a much wider scale compared to ck3 probably more similar to imperator rome's cohort systems because the whole cohorts were also a professional standing army compared to the levies of pre-marian times suffice to say guys i am mega hyped for this and i hope you are too so let's see what next week's going to bring with the economic system that's going to be a big one for sure and i hope it's not just a little tease and we get more than just a little in it right if you enjoyed this video you're going to like the other dev diary talks about tinto and eu5 in the description below and i want to give a massive thank you to all of my patrons channel members and twitch subscribers i would not be able to do this without all your support 